my last lecture, I mentioned Picasso's jealous reaction in Matisse's The Joy of Life. This painting was Picasso's counterthrust, and many art historians consider it to be his finest work. We'll get to our presenter in a moment, but first a little more about Picasso. Since he painted throughout the 20th century, he straddles a bunch of our isms. Picasso simply can't be contained to a single category. So, for example, this work was painted during what art historians call Picasso's Blue Period. There are lots more blue paintings out there. Note the influence of Matisse. In fact, there are lots more Picasso's period. Picasso was a child prodigy who became arguably the most important painter of the 20th century. He was producing saleable drawings by the time he was nine, and by 1900, when he had reached the ripe old age of 19, he was turning out a painting every day. He kept painting until his death at age 92. He died by far the richest artist in history. During this lifetime, he is estimated to have produced more than 30,000 works of art. Okay, now it is our presenter's turn. I've already mentioned the influence of African art on expressionist painters such as Deron and Matisse, what's called, rather obnoxiously, primitivism. In this painting, the mask motif should be clear. So are the distortion, flattened space, fragmented bodies, and black lines used as a grid or scaffolding. After the brilliant colors of the expressionists, sometimes bright and pure, sometimes harsh and jarring, we now encounter a much more limited palette of pinks, grays, blues, and browns. Actually, art historians debate whether Les Demoiselles d'Avignon should be classified as an expressionist work or as the first Cubist painting. I've rather arbitrarily stuck it into my Cubism lecture. Note, too, that the composition, like Cezanne's still life and landscape paintings, like Matisse's work, is filled with contradictory points of view that are deliberately disorients the viewer. So we look down at the table at the bottom of the canvas, but we encounter the nudes head on. We see the eyes full face and the noses in profile. The seated figure on the lower right faces her colleague, but manages to turn her head 180 degrees to look at us. So we're returning to the conceptual art that we saw very early in the course, and that's quite deliberate. We've already seen a move toward abstraction. In the case of Kandinsky, we've arrived there. But it's important to understand that artists had different reasons for creating abstract art. Some artists, such as Kandinsky and Mondrian, whom we'll encounter soon, were seeking spiritual transcendence, really a kind of escape from the material world into a deeper underlying reality. But especially early in the 20th century, most abstract artists were not so much escaping the material world as trying to distill its essential qualities and capture these qualities in painting and in sculpture. The Cubists really fit into this second category. And Cubists themselves, perhaps appropriately, splinter into different categories. The movement began with the analytical Cubists, which is really means two men, Picasso and Brock. They saw themselves as dissectors, as scientists, if you will, looking for essential shapes and how they interact with the negative space around them. And the distinction between the space of the figure and the space around it, the negative space, becomes very blurred uh, in Cubist and a lot of later art as well. Um, and they look especially at how you see these from multiple perspective, and especially when displayed on a two-dimensional surface. Remember that this is the age of Einstein, when people are fascinated with the notion that time and space are relative, uh, and it's the time of modernism when art becomes very self-conscious, painting is often about painting. So here's a very early Cubist painting, just a year after the Demoiselle d'Avignon. Picasso is reducing the house and garden to simplified geometric forms. I think we see a lot of debt to Cezanne here. But he still maintains the color difference between the house and the garden. We see the same features in this early Cubist painting by Georges Braque, which too could almost be a Cezanne. Braque is still moving toward abstraction. But here he pretty much arrives full-throated cubism. So let's hear from our next student presenter. 
In analytical cubist paintings, not only the figures fragment, the distinction between object and its surrounding space breaks down as well. This blurring of positive and negative space is enhanced by the almost monochromatic use of colors. You've heard, I trust, that the Portuguese was a musician that Brock saw in a bar. Notice how Brock asks the viewer not only to look for familiar shapes, such as the sound hole in the guitar, but also to read into the painting what we know about the subject. Brock also inserts text into the painting, but it's not a text we can easily interpret. Is the message here that perhaps we need to read meaning into a painting? Certainly Picasso and Brock believed the viewers needed to learn how to read Cubist paintings, just as they had learned to read illusionistic paintings that employed linear perspective. After all, wasn't Einstein forcing everyone to rethink these relationships? Analytical cubism basically smashes an object to see all of its individual pieces. The next stage of cubism, which began in 1912, saw Picasso and Brock taking those individual pieces and reassembling them in a new way. Hence the term synthesis or putting together. In the process, they invented the collage. None of these works show up on a list, but they have a lot of influence on works that do, such as Stepanova's photo montage, so I want you to see a little synthetic cubism. Here's an example. It wasn't in your reading, but it's one of Picasso's most famous works. Notice that in this painting, it's easier, or this uh, collage painting, it's easier to make out the three figures, but does that middle figure really have a face? Notice, too, how the ground of the painting shifts from left to right. And did you see the dog under the table? Of course, the rest of it. In this painting, Picasso also embraces brighter colors. So here are a couple more examples of synthetic cubism, more obviously collages. Uh, during the synthetic cubism phase, Picasso and Brock also began incorporating real objects into their paintings. Uh, a photolithograph pattern of a cane chair seat reproduced on oil cloth that's glued onto the canvas and a rope border. Here are three Brock collages with actual newspaper articles glued into the painting. The Picasso, this Picasso collage dates from what is known as his Rococo Cubist period. You remember Rococo art, right? What might make this Rococo? Well, we see an evocation of luxury items, maybe a hint of aristocratic decadence. decadence. I really just throw this in because I thought it was fun. So this is actually a sculpture made from sheet metal. Even in his three-dimensional, in this three-dimensional object, Picasso is playing with the juxtaposition of two and three depictions, three-dimensional depictions of space and volume. While abstract, this work comes closer to what we think of as sculpture, in part because it's made of traditional sculpture material, bronze on the left uh, and stone on the right. But you'll see the cubist emphasis on reducing objects to planes, or in this case, to stylized geometric volumes. And no, uh, this artist doesn't show up, and in fact, we don't have any cubist sculpture on the list, but I want you to see some. Here are some more works by the same sculptor. Let me hit you with one last ism before I close. This is one I don't think you need to remember for the test since this work has dropped off the list. But I think it's interesting. Some artists, most notably the famous architect Le Corbusier, whom we will see soon, they criticized cubism. They argued it was too cerebral, too out of touch with the realities of modern life, and especially the realities of the machine age. Purists admired what they saw as the clean, functional lines of modern machines but they were fascinated by cubist dissection of objects in space as well. Leger is the best known of the purist painters. You saw him in your reading. Uh, in this painting, he tries to capture the infrastructure and pulsing life of a city. Why are machines so pure? Well, I'm not sure, but purism is a good lead into futurism, which is where I will begin my next lecture.